Hey everybody, it's Mr. Cadell. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, because I kind of like the end of uh, our genetics unit. We're going to talk about transcription and translation. That's chapter 17. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and then we'll get to some inheritance patterns in chapters 14, 15, and then 18 is like all the new stuff. And uh, that's always fun to teach because it changes every year. Um, you know, when we look at chapter 17, um, it's pretty long, it's pretty hard, but again, the concept is something that you've already learned about. You see a deer here that's a uh, white color, and maybe it's supposed to provoke the thought, um, you know, how does an organism get a message to create a characteristic like us with like tongue width or finger length or hair color or whatever it may be. And it, it all comes down to genes. You don't want genes on DNA being turned on uh, willy nilly, like um, without uh, any sort of like, um, con sorry, it's all unconscious, um, uh, without some sort of um, strategy behind it. You don't want like um, tongue cells being made on your cheek or liver cells or uh, bone cells, but it does happen in some people. And so we need to regulate uh, which genes are turned on or off at any given time. And we're going to touch on that today with chapter 17. And then in chapter 18, we'll go into it much more in depth. You know, um, chapter 17 is fine, but I don't really like this Beetle and Tatum exper experiment. I never have. And I don't think it does very much for students personally. So I'm going to have you skip all this stuff. But then we're going to talk a little bit about transcription and translation, some of the basics, and then... Um, this is still the basics, and then we'll go into a transcription here, and then we're going to stop. So we're just going to go over 17.1, the beginning of the chapter in 17.1 right now. You know, um, you might be wondering who's awesome these days, and I'm going to tell you that you're pretty awesome. Let's start with the movie. Nobody can tell you how Cells come in many different varieties, with many different functions. But inside almost every cell is a nucleus, containing 99.9% .9 of your genes, and mitochondria, containing a few more genes. All told, you have nearly 20,000 genes. Your genes are small parts of a long molecule called DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. If you lined up all of the DNA containing all of your genes, it would measure six feet long. But it's coiled so tightly that it fits in just one cell nucleus. DNA is a double-stranded molecule composed of sugar, phosphate, and four different bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. These bases spell out the language known as the genetic code. The number and order of these four bases determine, for example, whether you are a chimp, a cow, a banana, or a human. Most genes are recipes for making specific proteins. These recipes are passed down from parents to children, from generation to generation. When someone says, you have your father's hair, what they mean is, you appear to have inherited a gene or genes from your father that makes a protein that instructs your hair molecule cells to produce hair that curls like your father's. Could you imagine being my wife or my daughter and having me overcomplicate everything? I feel for them too. Um, this is how I would have explained it to my daughter rather than you just have your father's hair, which she doesn't, thankfully. Um, anyway, um, the idea is, is that there's a flow of information and uh, there's only about 1% of DNA that actually codes for protein, that's actually gene. That's where it's important. We've done this before, and I want you to do it again. Go ahead and pull out a piece of paper here. Please pause and write down the flow of genetic information um, in all organisms. Remember what this first arrow is? You're right, it's transcription. 
The message on DNA is transcribed into a message that we call RNA, and then that is translated. That's this arrow right here. It's translation. This is translated into another message, uh, a message of amino acids, which then go out to the Golgi body and they fold into protein. So the point is that I know you know this. We're now finally in chapter 17. We're going to put all of this together here. That's what this chapter is all about. Um, what I find fascinating about this whole process is that it's conserved across all organisms. Uh, you can pick up a mushroom or a bacteria or a human, and they all do this. They all do the same thing, which suggests a few things. Number one is that it works. Number two is that it's efficient and hasn't been naturally selected against, meaning there's nothing better that has come along in the last over billion years of uh, uh, biological evolution to replace this kind of flow of information and then the creation of something that that puts that information into practice, which are the proteins. They actually do the stuff in our bodies. Um, and number three, it suggests that this evolved long, long ago before there was all these independent lineages on the tree of life, because this thing is so complicated, it wouldn't have independently evolved in all organisms, like in monkeys and in mushrooms and in bacteria. Uh, and what that suggests is that it evolved here, way down at the base of the tree of life, and then it was so good that all of the organisms that broke off that and speciated into their own little niches in the environment and became what we know of them today or, or what they used to be, and now they're gone, extinct from this planet. But they all did the same thing. So this is super important. Let's finish the movie. But they usually march for a short version. The chickens tell the cell how to function. and what traits to express. More specifically, gene regulators turn different genes on and off in different cells to control cell function. The long molecules of DNA containing your genes are organized into pieces called chromosomes. Different species have different numbers of chromosomes. Humans usually have 46 chromosomes, two sets of 23. Here we go. Sorry, I was just opening the window. Um, here we are, chapter 17. Um, this is a picture that uh, I like. I have it on a handout here. I don't know if I'm giving you handouts these days, but this is a picture that exists in your book. And it's just going to show you um, a comparison between this information flow in bacteria and eukaryotic cells. You can imagine that it's probably a little bit more complicated in eukaryotic cells. As far as bacterial cells go and eukaryotic cells, what do you see that's different here? Well, obviously there's a nucleus in the eukaryotic cell and then something happens. RNA processing after transcription occurs in that nucleus. And that's where the real secret sauce is with respect to eukaryotic cells and then by extension, eukaryotic organisms. How they can do so many more things than ba simple bacteria. Um, like we can walk down hallways and drive cars and things like that. Um, so we're gonna get to that di difference. But first let's look at the bacterial cell. It's pretty straightforward. They do transcription. Um, they have these little uh, circular pieces of DNA called plasmids, or they have their big chromosome, singular chromosome, that's a circular one. Uh, that's where the transcription occurs. Genes are transcribed to make messenger RNA. That then is immediately translated by ribosomes that exist in their cytosol, which is the solution that surrounds, um, I guess, the, that it is in the middle of a bacteria. I guess it surrounds the chromosome, but everything surrounds the chromosome because there is no nucleus immediately translated without any processing. So in a eukaryotic cell, you're gonna see here that it, it occurs more kind of in a um, shelter. Uh, and I like to think of it as maybe a library that's protected. The books are protected like the DNA would be our um, analogy. And you can open up the DNA, you look at it, you transcribe down onto a piece of paper, what you think the, the book is saying, then you close the book and you put it back on the shelf. It's all protected in the building. And now the book is closed again. That's how we treat in eukaryotic organisms in our cells. 
the DNA. It's super protected. Um, then we have this pre-mRNA. And so it would be like your little kind of notes that you have that you've transcribed down, and then you edit those, make it maybe more reader friendly before you take it somewhere else. In this case, taking it out into the cytoplasm. So it says transcription produces messenger RNA. That then's gonna go out into the cytoplasm after the RNA processing. We'll get to that detail. It's um, like I said, it's where the magic happens for you here at Excels. And then trans translation occurs similar to what happens in prokaryotic cells. What you are about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret. The innermost particles of how a simple coat is turned into flesh and blood. This is what Francis Crick called the central dogma of modern biology. How DNA makes protein. It starts with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. It's these that trigger the first phase of the process, leading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. A gene is the length of DNA stretching to the left. Everything's ready to roll. Three, two, one. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. It's unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. That's transcription that you're seeing. The yellow chain sneaking out of the top is a copy of the genetic message, and it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to make an exact copy of the A's, C's, G's, and T's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related nucleic acid known as U. You are watching this process called transcription in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. It's a bit like taking the information off a hard disk on a computer and putting it into memory, but you know, making it a real program that's running. So that process of DNA to RNA is like making, it's like running a program, you know, double clicking on a on, on an icon. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes away from the nucleus into the outer part of the cell. Then in a dazzling display of choreography, all the components of another molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. This is translation. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a stream of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. Those are tRNAs. They all carry a specific three-letter code that will be read by the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off three letters at a time and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer line. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid in carex is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Yes, my heart is fluttering and my knees are quaking. 
I love it. I, I never get tired of it. Um, uh, anyway, th there it is. Please briefly explain to your neighbor how information flows from gene to protein. I get it. For some others of you, uh, this is probably how you feel right now. Um, let's go here. Here's another picture. We're, we're only going to go with um, three or four pictures today, just on the front of this piece of paper here. Um, here's another picture that is, exists in your textbook. Basically, this is another way of representing it in cartoon form, how energy flows from DNA, uh, and eventually you're going to get a sequence of amino acids to make a protein. So how are the instructions for assembling amino acids into proteins encoded into the DNA? Don't really like I stole that from the book's publisher. Don't really like it. The flow of information from gene to protein is based on a triplet code. You probably heard this before. It's based on threes. And uh, these three things are nucleotides that exist on the RNA. And these three things together is called a codon. And you see that down there in the bottom right corner of the picture. So every three letters is called a codon on mRNA. These are a series of non overlapping three nucleotide words. There they are called codons. So codons along an mRNA molecule are then re read by the ribosomes uh, when translation occurs in the cytoplasm, eukaryotic cells, in the five to three direction. You can see, sorry, I guess on your picture that would be from the left to the right, and then you can see that four different amino acids there are being put in sequence. There's the RNA. Codon specifies the amino acid to be placed at the correct position along the polypeptide. All of this should just be reviewed for you. Um, here they are, tryptophan, phenylalanine, glycine, and serine. So if we have AGT, uh, way up there, if, if you notice in the top right corner of the DNA strand, um, if we have AGT, that then will be transcribed. You can see that UCA is the three-letter codon on the right side of that red there on the messenger RNA. And when that is translated, you will see serine. That's the amino acid that's put in sequence. The reason why I know that is because it's on the cartoon um, that exists in the textbook and on your screen, but also because of this. This is a codon chart. You don't have to memorize these. You don't have to memorize um, the classes of, of amino acids, although I told you that there's three different classes. Um, you don't have to memorize which codon corresponds to each amino acid because I will give this to you on the test. So will the AP people. Um, they, uh, they don't want you to memorize this, but you have to know how to use this. So if, um, well, actually, I'm not even going to give you an example because we're going to do an example right here. Remember that the 20 amino acids look like this. They have a, an amine group, a carboxyl group, and a carbon bound to a hydrogen, and then an R group, which gives each amino acid its character. Here's an example of the hydrophobic amino acids that humans use. Uh, there are 61 uh, amino acid uh, op options or opportunities here. Remember that there's only 20 of them. So what that does, and you can see that that different codons in the amino uh, in the uh, mRNA chain will correspond with the same amino acid, and that actually is great. Um, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. But it has to do with mutations on the DNA really not causing that much trouble as far as what proteins are being made. And that then in turn keeps people healthy. Uh, you can see that um, three codons correspond to stop. And what that means basically is to the ribosome, stop doing translation. We're done with the important message on here on the mRNA. And then whatever you have is the amino acid sequence, uh, it's done. And uh, let's get it off to the Golgi body so it can fold and then either stay in the cell or leave the cell and go do its job. Well. I told you that we're going to um, we're going to uh, practice this. So go ahead and press pause. You can write that down. I have it written up here also. Make sure that you then write down the corresponding RNA and the corresponding amino acid sequence. And I'm going to do the same.
Okay, I'm back. Remember that the, uh, the RNA is read in a five to three direction, which means in order to make the RNA, we had to read the DNA in a three to five direction. Because if we read the DNA in the three to five direction, that means that we're going to be adding RNA in a five to three direction. And I'm going to show you a picture of this in a bit. Um, what this means is that I find this fascinating is which side does the RNA polymerase know to transcribe during transcription? Um, meaning, uh, let, let's call this the template strand. So this is called the template. It's supposed to be an A. This is the template that's going to be used to make the mRNA over here, and then I'll put an arrow, and then I'll put amino acid. So eventually amino acid. So we're going to use this, right? We're going to read the three to five direction. But maybe the MR, the RNA polymerase wants to read this side in the three to five direction. So you always have to make sure that you understand that there's one side of DNA that's read, three to five, that's called the template strand. I'm going to write N-O-N -O over here. This is the non-template strand that's not being read. Um, or otherwise, I mean, we could read it. We would go this way, and then we could get an mRNA made on that. But in this case, and in this case, we're reading it in the three to five direction. This is just one half or one side of a DNA string. So I hope this was reviewed for you. But get your fives and threes uh, in order. Make sure every time you do something like this, you understand the five and the three and the three and the five. Understand that there's non-template strands and that there's template strands that we use to make the mRNA. Well, uh, I guess it's 17.2, um, sorry, uh, it's transcription. So there's, there's a few steps in this chapter. There's transcription is 17.2, I guess. Uh, translation, this, this second black arrow is gonna be 17.3 um, and then we're gonna get to all this processing and stuff. Um, so let's do transcription. I'm going to show you the nuts and bolts here. Um, there are three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. And that's the same with uh, translation as well. So, so file those three things away and kind of sequester your understanding of transcription or translation as we have to initiate the process. Then let's make a bunch of, uh, of these monomers and a long sequence to make a polymer, essentially. Um, and that could be mRNA or that could be amino acids in a sequence with respect to translation. And then we're going to terminate the process. Um, we're going to go, we're going to watch a movie right now, but we're going to go right here to this. This is our last picture in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of my handout. Um, we'll get to that. It's just some pictures out of the textbook in just a moment. Transcription is the process of making RNA from a DNA template. Several key factors are involved in this process, including DNA, transcription factors, RNA polymerase, and ATP. Transcription begins with a strand of DNA. It is divided into several important regions. The largest of these is the transcription. This portion of the DNA will be used to produce RNA. Upstream of the transcription is the Tata box. An enhancer region may also be involved. Several complexes, known as transcription factors, are required for successful transcription. The first is TF2D, the largest of the general factors. A component of this factor, TBP, binds to the DNA using the Tata box to position TF2D near the transcription initiation site. Other transcription factors, including TF2A and TF2B, then attach. These complexes prepare the DNA for the successful binding of RNA polymerase. Once RNA polymerase is bound, other transcription factors complete the mature transcription complex. Now, energy must be added to the system for transcription to begin. This energy is provided by the reduction of ATP into ADP and PI. RNA polymerase then synthesizes an RNA template from the strand of DNA. Most factors are released after transcription begins. When the end of the transcription unit is reached, the RNA polymerase dissociates and the newly formed strand of RNA is released.
Okay, there it is in cartoon form. Um, I want you to understand what we were looking at there is a section of DNA, the template portion of DNA. So we have DNA, and you can see it on the screen or on your, your picture right now, and it's going to actually be physically open. The hydrogen bonds between the nucleotide bases will be broken, and it will be opened by this RNA polymerase um, um, protein, which is going to do the transcription. Um, so that's what you were looking at there, but you were also looking at a bunch of other proteins, and I'm going to show you those in a second. Remember, on this picture, we're following the bottom strand from our perspective, three to five. We're going from left to right here, and then the RNA transcript is being made in a five to three direction, because we can only add new nucleotides to the three prime end of any growing nucleotide chain of, of, of nucleic acid. So RNA synthesis is catalyzed by RNA polymerase. You see it right there. Presses the DNA strands apart and hooks together the RNA nucleotides. It's called the transcription unit. We see the promoter region way over there on the left side. Um, it's usually about 20 to 25 bases upstream of where you actually want to begin uh, doing transcription, where the gene really starts. And that's characterized often by this sequence TATA -T -A, on the DNA, on the template strand of the DNA. In fact, when the Human Genome Project went uh, went down and they were able to sequence all the letters of DNA, they just got a supercomputer um, to look at those six billion letters and they said, okay, where do we see TATA -T -A, and every, anywhere you see that, which is many times um, over that span of letters, we're going to flag that and then in a reasonable sequence of letters later, will we see the termination sequence on the template strand, T, T, A, T, T, T. And if they saw this, then this about with a thousand letters or 10,000 letters in between it, they said, okay, that's probably a gene. Of course they didn't know, but they just made an educated guess. And that's how they said that, oh, there's 23,000 genes in the human body. And so they've been getting better at looking at this and identifying what is actually gene on DNA ever since that time. The DNA sequence where the RNA polymerase attaches is called the promoter, the promoter region. Well, we already talked about the Taka box, and you can see in this picture the RNA polymerase sitting there. They call that the start point at the beginning of the gene. Eukaryotic transcription begins when RNA polymerase 2 binds to the promoter region of the gene. A crucial part of this initiation process is the recognition and binding of the Taka sequence, a short stretch of DNA rich in thymine and adenine nucleotide. The subunit of RNA polymerase 2 that binds to the Tata sequence is called the Tata binding protein. The Tata binding protein binds to DNA using an eight stranded beta sheet that rests atop the DNA helix like a saddle. Two protein loops drape down the sides of the DNA like stirrups. Binding of the Tata binding protein introduces a severe kink in the DNA backbone. This kink dramatically bends the DNA helix by nearly 90 degrees and is thought to provide a signal to assemble the rest of the transcription complex at the initiation site. Well, let's see what this, the rest of this initiation complex looks like. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide, but what you basically need to know is that it is really a big deal every time any gene is transcribed to then be translated and then eventually make a protein. It's a big deal. It's going to take a lot of resources. We need to be able to control this process. If it just goes unencumbered and we're just pumping out protein, often that's really bad news for a cell. It might even be bad news for the organism. If, if some sort of um, protein is being made, which shuts down the ability to regulate cell division and growth, and then all of a sudden you have a tumor or a lump or maybe what we call cancer or things. So, so it's super important that we regulate this. And that is why, well, my initial thing that I told you how maybe we can make these other types of tissues here? And the answer is yes, because we have the same DNA in every cell of our body. Uh, the DNA in a bone cell is the same as a liver cell, is the same as a cheek cell. But the question is, which genes get turned on where and when and why? And so usually they have these proteins called repressor proteins that are sitting on them. And what we need to do is we need to knock those off or, or they may not even be there in certain um, cells where certain proteins need to be made. And that's why this process is so heavily regulated. You saw in the cartoon movie uh, two movies ago and you see on this picture that there's all sorts of these complexes, these protein complexes that have to come on. It's like 20 to 30 different proteins, perfectly shaped, perfectly put together, 
perfectly put on the right spot to then, these are transcription factors, and then they allow this whole process to be initiated. Just be overwhelmed by how specific it is and how much detail there is and how we evolved to get this way. But number two, it's occurring in every cell of your body right now that protein is being made. That's all cells are, they're protein producing factories. That's it. Find this figure, um, see that at the bottom of that initiation complex, and if everything is perfect, finally transcription can take place. It's pretty cool. Transcription factors mediate the binding of RNA polymerase and this initiation of this transcription process. No problem there. The couple, completed assembly of transcription factors and RNA polymerase to bound to a promoter is a transcription initiation complex. We've seen this movie, uh, this period, uh, but what I want to show you here, this is the beginning of transcription. See all these things that have to come in there and have to be perfect. And then and only then can the DNA bend over. We'll learn about that in chapter 17. And then the RNA polymerase can go ahead and transcription can take place where the mRNA is being made from a message on DNA. It's pretty cool, uh, I think. Anyway, so let's elongate this. It happens uh, very quickly. I think it's like um, 30 or 40 amino, uh, sorry, uh, new nucleotides a second um, make RNA where there once was a message on DNA. As the RNA polymerase moves along the DNA and twists it, it's going to break it 10 to 20 bases at a time. Well, my sources tell me it's more than that. <laughs> oh, I'm wrong so often. It, it doesn't even phase me anymore. Um, so let's elongate this. Remember, DNA is read in a three to five direction because we have to make RNA in a five to three direction. And you can see that on this picture, how uh, new nucleotides, uh, RNA nucleotides are being added to the three prime end. Make sure that you get this down. And then you can see how the DNA then closes right back up like someone would close up a book to keep all the information in it protected. Oh, there it is, that haunting little highway sign, 53. Awesome. Then transcription progresses at a rate of 40 nucleotides per second, yes. The eukaryotes. Isn't that awesome? I didn't even know what was going to be said on this slide. Just going for it. Um, finally, then, it's going to end here. Um, let's terminate this. And remember what I told you, uh, once the RNA polymerase hits a sequence, it kind of looks like this, TT, A, T, T, T. I'll just commit that to memory. Uh, then the RNA polymerase falls off the whole, uh, sorry, the whole, it dissociates from the DNA and then transcription stops. I have a movie to show you. RNA is called transcription. Transcription begins when RNA polymerase recognizes and binds to the promoter region on the double-stranded DNA molecule. A particular subunit of the messenger RNA, called the sigma factor, participates in recognition of the promoter region. Soon after transcription is initiated, the sigma factor dissociates from the RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase moves along the template strand of the DNA, synthesizing the complementary single-stranded messenger RNA molecule. Synthesis is in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, with new nucleotides being added to the 3' prime end of the growing messenger RNA molecule. As the RNA polymerase advances along the DNA, it melts a new stretch of DNA and allows the previous stretch to close. When RNA polymerase reaches a specific sequence of nucleotides on the DNA called the transcription terminator, a hairpin loop structure forms in the messenger RNA, causing the RNA polymerase and the messenger RNA to dissociate from the DNA. Well, here is kind of the summary picture of transcription. Make sure that you find this in your textbook. I've written down here in the bottom right-hand corner some things that I would like you to teach your neighbor about right now. Um, Press pause, please. Go over this, make sure you get it down. Uh, it's only gonna get more complicated with translation and then the stuff after translation. So make sure that you got the, uh, transcription now rock solid. Sorry, I keep butchering everything. Is science that awesome after all? I think so.